a time to be born. This is a familiar phrase to most people. It's an ancient phrase. It comes from the recognition by the ancients that nature is cyclical, that animals, sheep, horses, other species of domestication were born at certain times of year. So this recognition that time plays a role in our lives from the beginning is an ancient one. But there are other dimensions of time that relate to birth, especially for the human, that need to be considered. The time course of pregnancy being one of them. Normal pregnancy runs, as most people know, nine months, more exact, uh, 38 to 40 weeks. If the pregnancy is interrupted before that, problems arise. We talk about preterm birth being a pregnancy that ends before weeks 37. If it ends much earlier than that, the chances of the baby surviving are very, very poor. Technology has advanced so far that a late preemie after week 30, 32 of pregnancy has a good chance of survival, but may still have a lifelong series of disabilities from neurological, immunological, and otherwise. The causes of preterm labor are diverse, many still unknown. And there really hasn't been much advancement in this field in the last 30, 40 years. There are a lot of drugs used which extend labor from the point of preterm contractions, maybe a week. And granted, every day is valuable. The longer the pregnancy lasts, the more likely the child will be to survive. But I'm interested in time as you might have picked up. So there's another dimension of time that everyone knows about when it comes to labor. You ask any OBGYN, when are babies born? And they all say, well, at night. That's why I've got to work nights so often. Um, but you ask them, why? Why does it happen at night? There's no answer. It just is. Well, I'm a scientist. I don't like answers like that. So I wanted to know, why does it happen? Why does labor typically in an 80, 85% of the human population begin at night? Now you can answer this in different ways. You can say, well, there's an advantage to babies being born at night. At least there used to be, say a million years ago, if the woman was pregnant and would uh, retreat to her clan, to her tribe, in the caves or in the huts, she would be around her peers, her families, and be safe. The likelihood of the child being born in safety and security is much improved. Interestingly, in other animals, rodents that are active at night are giving birth in the daytime. Well, those animals in the daytime are in their burrows. So it's the same logic that they're with their mates and protected and safe. So that's one answer. But it's not the answer I'm looking for. When I see a trace like this, I think of clocks, biological clocks. We're all familiar with our sleep-wake cycles. This is known to be under the control of a part of the brain known as our clock. And this circadian clock, which times 24-hour rhythms, regulates all sorts of things, not just our sleep-wake cycles. As you can see on this graph, it regulates when our fastest reaction times are, late afternoon, when our blood pressure rises the most, when we're most alert, when our body temperature is the minimum, and so on. So I've, over the last 15 years, tried to address the possibility that the timing of labor, shown here in pink, which is nighttime, is somehow associated with the brain's clock via its main hormonal signal, melatonin. Now, who here has not heard of melatonin? 
I think everyone's heard of melatonin in the context of sleep, right? Most people know it in that regard. Turns out it's a major hormonal output signal of the brain to the rest of the body to tell us it's nighttime, certain things should happen, and other things shouldn't happen. <clears throat> a real interesting feature of melatonin is the fact that it is secreted by the brain in response to signals from the clock, but it also feeds back and works on the clock. This is why I take it, for example, for jet lag. I can reset my clock so that when I land in Paris, I'm no longer in American time zone. I'm in European time zone. It's a nice little trick I learned along the way. Uh, this is a study from over 20 years ago showing the pattern of sleep and wake in a blind child. Now, blind people generally have a lot of issues with keeping their sleep-wake cycles in sync with the outside world. On the left, you can see the red trace uh, tracks the onset of sleep, those dark horizontal bars. Each row is a different day. And this child is doing what we say free running. That is to say, the clock doesn't have a sense of when's the right time to sleep and when's the right time to wake up. And this is, of course, very challenging for the child to stay awake in the daytime, for example, um, and for the parents, quite obviously. In this study, one of the earlier studies, it's been replicated a million times, they gave melatonin at those green points in the right graph, and I think everyone immediately senses what's going on. The clock is now locked into that. So this melatonin signal serves as a feedback signal to our clocks to establish the proper day-night rhythms. So this was very tantalizing to me in the context of the timing of birth. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, rats, since they're night active, they tend to give birth in the daytime. In a study by Takayama many years ago, they showed that in the normal case, the, the blue little mice there, are rats, um, will normally be born during the daytime when melatonin is low, that blue arrow. Um, however, if you remove the source of melatonin, which is the brain's pineal gland, uh, that rhythm is lost. These animals are giving birth across 24 hours pretty randomly. However, if you restore melatonin to the mother, rat, in a manner that replicates the normal nighttime pattern, you get back to the normal timing of birth. So this was very strong evidence for me that there is a connection between melatonin and the timing of birth at least in the rat. Now, I can't go taking the pineal gland out of women who are pregnant to study this, right? So I had to approach this whole question in a different manner. My hypothesis, graphically shown here, is that labor leading to birth uh, is occurring during the nighttime, and as I've indicated, the largest majority of uh, women do enter labor at nighttime. These contractions here, shown in pink, get higher and higher during the course of night, Correlated with that is this rise of melatonin <clears throat> in the bloodstream. So the hypothesis I developed about 10 years ago is that the timing of human labor is a circadian event, a 24-hour pattern that is mediated by the action of melatonin. Melatonin in pregnancy was not very well studied. I was one of the fearless scientists who would attack this question. Um, we know it signals night phase. We were the first group to show that the receptors, the, the antenna for the melatonin proteins in the uterus are present. Um, we showed in a series of studies that these receptors, when melatonin is present, causes contractions of the uterus. This is very similar to oxytocin. Many people know oxytocin as a labor-inducing drug. Interesting. Um, and very important for our thinking is that the receptors in the uterus are not there throughout most of pregnancy, but appear at the end of pregnancy when labor begins. Very analogous to the oxytocin receptors. So there rose the question, well, if you're saying it might be linked to preterm, but there's no receptors in the uterus during most of pregnancy, how can that be? So we had to make it very Herculean effort to find women who would give us biopsy material when they went into preterm labor. This was not easy. But we managed to get five samples, and all five of these women 
have melatonin receptors. So this really excited us that the hypothesis could be true. Our working hypothesis then, out of all this data, was that melatonin underlies contractions leading to labor. Well, if we impede, if we somehow interfere with that signal, we should be able to lower contractions. Well, how does one do that? Like I say, I'm not going to take the pineal gland out of these women. Um, there are drugs, which we use in the laboratory, can block the receptors. They've never been clinically tested. There are drugs which can block the synthesis in the brain. Again, too many side effects. <clears throat> so we landed upon a unique approach, and yet one that's not unfamiliar. You've probably heard or read somewhere along the way about phototherapy. Yeah? Phototherapy is used to treat seasonal affective disorder, which is a circadian disorder, by the way, winter depression, right? And it involves using a lamp, a phototherapy monitor, that the person looks at in the morning to lower their depressive state. Well, I have friends in this field, as you might imagine, and so I said, hey, can I borrow your phototherapy lamp for a few years? <laughs> he said, a few years? <laughs> Maybe a few months? But I, I managed to compromise on a year. Um, and we set up a study involving pregnant women undergoing contractions. Now, these weren't preterm contractions because there's no way to know, are you going to go preterm next week? We can't know this, right? So we had to go with women late in pregnancy who were starting to contract. Needless to say, this was somewhat risky because in a few cases they had their babies before they came to the study. Uh, we had to wait till the very end of pregnancy to see those contractions appearing. The hypothesis, the prediction shown here, is that that melatonin rise, the blue line here, which is the normal pattern, by inhibiting it with light, which is known to work, should suppress contractions, right? If melatonin underlies those contractions, if we suppress melatonin, we should suppress contractions. People thought I was crazy. I said, what? You're going to show a light to pregnant women and stop their contractions? That's nuts. Well, maybe I'm a little nuts. <laughs> but it worked. It worked. Every woman responded to light. We gave them one hour of light exposure, shown here, the white bar, at 11 p.m. at night. You see the contractions earlier rising as the night proceeds. That one hour of light suppressed every woman, not entirely. Some were suppressed by 50%, others by 60%, others 100%. Remarkably, when we turned the light off, they remained suppressed in most cases for many hours. So there was a bit of a lag phase there after suppression. And then there's a bit of a rebound. Here are four examples. And you see there's some variability. You know, people aren't rats. They're very divergent in their responses to things. But in every case, we lowered contractions and generally suppressed them for hours. When I told the Office of Intellectual Property about this, they said, get a patent. You got to get a patent. So we did. And that led to KinderMed. We formed this company three years ago with the goal of using light as a drug, if you will. Light to suppress contractions. Now, you can't really envision a woman at risk of preterm labor using a phototherapy lamp every night to blast her partner. You know, that's not going to work, right? So we decided we needed to develop a, an individual light-emitting device, better known as a mask. And more importantly, we wanted to fine-tune it. Turns out that the suppression of melatonin by white light is entirely due to one wavelength, and that's blue light. Now, isn't that interesting? Blue light. Where do we normally see a lot of blue light in our world? The sky. Hey, don't tell me iPhones. The sky. <laughs> the sky. It's blue. We evolved under this world where blue light was daytime. And so our eyes have developed a specific sensor for blue light. And it's that wavelength of light that is the most effective at suppressing melatonin. 
Now, it is present in iPhones and TV screens and all these other things, and that's why you should use the filter evenings to prevent that interference with your clock. <clears throat> More importantly, blue light goes through the skin, which means in a mask, if the woman's eyes are closed, it'll go through the closed eyelids. She doesn't have to stand there staring at this light <laughs> all night long, right? So we thought that was a clear advantage. So Kindermit has developed a mask, which I actually happen to have on me. Yeah. Now with the bright lights on the stage, you probably can't see this, but uh, this shines, well, as always, it doesn't work when I want it to. This is the mask. Small blue lights behind it. They come on automatically, suppress melatonin. The woman doesn't have to worry about anything other than sleeping. There are very few side effects, certainly fewer than drugs. It's comfortable, it's convenient, and it's very inexpensive. Drug therapy for preterm labor can run into the tens, $50,000 per treatment. So this is definitely an advance, we think. Our goal ultimately, of course, is to treat preterm labor. This is a huge problem. As I said, it hasn't changed in the world in 30 years. Still, about 10% of all pregnancies end in preterm labor. The emotional costs, the family costs, the healthcare costs are huge. We're talking 30, 40 billion dollars in this country alone. Annually in the world, 15 million babies are born preterm, and many of them don't survive. It's time to try something new, even if it appears science fiction. We think our blue light mask will make great strides in reducing preterm labor. We're working with Harvard right now on some testing of the mask and other groups around the country. My hope is that within a year, we can start saving millions of babies' lives around the world. Thank you very much.